Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend Rick from Blind, and today I have the honor of introducing you all to Frank Calderoni, who's the CEO of Velocity Global. So before joining Velocity Global, Frank was the chairman and CEO of Anaplane. During his tenure there, he took the company from a $1 billion unicorn valuation to an IPO and a transaction with Tama Bravo for nearly $11 billion. He has also been the CFO and executive vice president at Red Hat, Cisco Systems, and SanDisk. And for those of you that do not know, Velocity Global makes it simple to compliantly hire, pay, and manage talent anywhere by combining its seamless technology with local expertise in a whopping more than 185 countries. Thanks for coming on the show, Frank. Thank you, Rick. It's great to be here. I I hope you don't mind, but I'd love to start kind of right at the beginning, kind of in a short amount of time, you've been a high profile executive at some of the largest tech companies in the world. You know, how did you get to that point? Can you walk us through your career? Sure, I'm more than happy to. Um, it's it's been a it's been a great career. I really have enjoyed it, and I've been very fortunate over the years uh, to have worked for some great companies, and also more important than that is uh, worked with some great people, both worked for as well as worked with. And so I learned a lot uh, throughout my career. You know, I grew up in the New York tri-state area, and uh, I ended up going to uh, Fordham University, which is in the Bronx. Um, and I spent four years there. I actually um, went through um, kind of a business um, education. And so I got a degree both in uh, finance and accounting. I uh, didn't know much about business or finance and accounting, uh, but I thought it would be a great occupation uh, to think about. But I was able to, uh, during those years, uh, do some internship at IBM. And IBM was... Um, uh, you know, the company to work for, especially in the tri-state area. They had locations all over the place, different divisions. And so that opened myself up to a whole new uh, possibility as far as just learning about business and um, engaging on the professional side with so many uh, great colleagues. And I enjoyed that. I did uh, one summer, I did a second summer. And of course, having an accounting degree the right thing to do at that point was to go work for the public accounting firms like uh, EY or Price Waterhouse and things like that, which is where most of my other uh, students or friends were, were going. But I enjoyed the IBM experience so much that I, I decided they offered me a job uh, full-time when I graduated. And I said, why not? How can I pass down an opportunity at that time to work for the one of the large, I think they were top five company at the time. So I did, um, joined in finance, and uh, I didn't know at the time, but I ended up spending 21 years at IBM, um, advancing through all I started in, in, in finance, um, and I did end up throughout that career working in so many divisions, uh, different parts of the business. IBM was growing very rapidly, so they were constantly expanding. I got a fantastic, uh, fantastic opportunity to see the world. Uh, because of their global reach. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Europe. I spent a lot of time in Asia. And of course, in different places in the United States, it's sort of like that whole thing, I've been moved. Um, so I took advantage of it, um, especially uh, having just recently come out of college and uh, pretty much unattached. And so it was a fantastic professional um, opportunity as well as a personal opportunity uh, over those 21 years. They, they moved me out to California um, in the latter part of my tenure with IBM. Um, it was one of those things where at that time, I, I really enjoyed uh, living in the New York tri-state area. So I wasn't uh, looking forward to moving out West, but they twisted my arm uh, a couple of times. And I said, okay, I'll do it for a year. I, love, I loved it so much that I asked for a second year and asked for a third year. And then they said, no, we need you back in New York. And so at that point, I decided to stay in California and uh, venture out into a CFO opportunity. Uh, the market in the, in the Silicon Valley at that time was, was very robust, uh, so many different opportunities. I thought, you know, take on my first uh, C-suite opportunity at SanDisk, 
which was in the midst of uh, doing flash memory. Um, and so I was a public company CFO. Um, I spent a few years doing that, which again was another uh, uh, good experience. We were expanding. Uh, we were a fabulous company and the objective was to kind of own a fab ourselves so we can build a lot of uh, memory chips um, as the market was really booming. Um, I then uh, took on, just to diversify myself a little bit, I took on another CFO role after that a company called QLogic, which is in Southern California um, in Orange County. That company also was, was growing very rapidly. And so I had different opportunities in a different sector, uh, host bus adapters um, as they were growing and expanding. So throughout IBM, SanDisk, QLogic, I got very tech um, knowledge um, and I, I, I liked it. Um, I got myself very interested in understanding technology and participating, even though I was in financial roles on the business side. Um, the opportunity came up for me to join Cisco. Um, and so I came back from Southern California, went to uh, Northern California where they were headquartered in San Jose. And I ended up spending um, about 12 years with Cisco also in a great time because the company was growing very rapidly, expanding into different businesses be, beyond their core of switching and routing, um, uh, networking, uh, collaboration, software. Um, I was a CFO, uh, but also took on uh, a more operational role. Uh, I was kind of the quasi uh, COO. Um, John Chambers wanted us to really kind of take on different responsibilities. Um, I also was a very strong customer advocate, uh, so I learned a lot during that time frame of reaching out to executives and some of the customers that we have and forming relationships. So I got to learn a lot about selling and, and, and developing you know, longer term partnerships uh, from that perspective. Um, I then went to um, having done a host of different um, uh, transactions. Uh, with Cisco, we did a lot of acquisitions, uh, M&A side and things like that. I decided to move into a company, Red Hat, uh, which had an open uh, culture, but they were an open source. So this was purely all software. Uh, at that time, the market was hot to move to software. So I thought, let me get, even though I had some experience at Cisco, really kind of develop my skills around software. Um, and that was great. It was uh, headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and so that gave me uh, also an opportunity to kind of uh, back on the East Coast, but spend time in Boston, Raleigh, and San Francisco, as well as even more globally. And then, um, and that was more of a CFO, uh, COO role. And so I did also operational uh, roles. And I had the chance to be my and CEO at Anaplan. Uh, that opportunity came up, which is, I wasn't planning to leave Red Hat, but a CEO opportunity in a company that had a lot of um, foundational experience for me, having grown up in the finance space. It was a planning a company. Uh, so I did that for close to six years. Um, as you mentioned before, you know, we were about a billion dollar valuation when I joined. And then we ended up going through a public offering and then a sale to uh, Toma Bravo on the private side, uh, valued close to 11 billion. And so there was a lot of building and developing and uh, nurturing of the company that went on over those six years. Um, and then after the sale, I, I took a little bit of time off to decide what I want to do next. And Velocity Global came up, a similar type of um, uh, stage uh, as to when I joined Anaplan, uh, being the CEO of the company now, I've just recently joined. But I see a tremendous amount of potential uh, for growth and, and building of a, another scale company. Um, in the technology space, but also offering a service on a on the technology platform uh, globally. We operate in 185 countries, so I see that as a, a another great opportunity to really uh, take some of the experience I've had uh, in technology, uh, in global markets, uh, in building product, in building go to market organizations, uh, and leveraging that here. So, Frank, it's interesting. You've worked for some very high profile organizations. And when you moved, did you have any, like your accounting, finance, business person, do you have any metrics that you relied upon to say, hey, I'm going to leave Cisco to go somewhere else or go to Red Hat? 
Was it more gut? Was it more money? Was it more just like, okay, here's the checklist. And this is for people who are like watching, who are deciding if I'm going to switch jobs and move. Like, do you do it on emotions? Do you do, like, how did you make these decisions? So Jack, you know, thinking back, um, and again, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, it wasn't planned. Um, I, I really didn't have a plan. When I, you know, I, I grew up in the New York area. I didn't know much about business. Um, I, I, as I said, I, when I went to Fordham, um, I started to get more involved in businesses, but it was really jumping into IBM and just in that big pool of what was available to me, I learned to take advantage uh, of the situation. And one of the things I, even when I uh, coach people today or give them advice and counsel, I, I, I always went to opportunities that had challenges, um, jobs that maybe others would steer away from, um, because I felt that I wanted to learn. Um, and I felt if there was a problem that I could help solve, I could learn a lot, but also can contribute a lot. And I found throughout my IBM career, uh, that enabled me to kind of branch outside of my core, you know, let's say finance role and really start learning about technology, learning about markets, uh, learning about different businesses. I mean, as I said before, I've been through so many different businesses at IBM as it was growing. We had 12 different separate businesses. And I always, I wanted to learn about each and every one. And so I moved around just primarily to learn and learning, I was able to contribute and then get recognized for what I can offer. And so then other opportunities kind of open themselves up uh, to me. And going through that with IBM then also opened up different things outside of IBM. And that's when I started moving into SanDisk or QLogic. So I didn't plan for those. It was sort of at the time I felt it was um, an opportunity that was out there that had a challenge or a new way for me to expand my experience. And I took it. In addition to the challenge, is there also something that you start feeling, maybe I've run my course doing this X work, and then you become open and receptive to other opportunities because you feel like maybe I've learned all I can, and now I owe it to myself to take on that next challenge. Is that maybe how it works? There's some that? of that. Yeah, there's some of that. I mean, you, you want to, I, I like to see things through. I don't like yeah. to leave things, you know, open or unfinished. So I would, you know, as I think back to the different roles I had in the companies I was part of, I feel like I've, I was able to master those with, with one for myself, but also giving uh, and contributing to the company, you know, seeing things through um, and feeling, okay, yeah, I, I've done this and I've been able to kind of really build right. this and leave it uh, for, let's say someone else and then try uh, a different opportunity. So yes, that was part of it as well. It, it, and it's interesting and I don't mean to be too forward but it doesn't sound like you were looking just at the money equation. It seems like you were looking more for I the never, challenge never, and then I the never. money will come, I guess, right? Exactly. And I always, I always, you know, again, it wasn't intended that way um, but it, it's, it's a good, uh, Jack, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's a, a very good point. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, you can see, because I've actually managed and led uh, teams with people. And if you're there with the right purpose of, of really kind of contributing and learning, um, it gets recognized even more so rather than I'm there just for, you know, I just want to get the, the, you know, the, the money or the pay or something like that. Uh, and I'm ready to move on to the next thing. So I would highly recommend uh, people just, you know, contribute your best always excel, raise that bar, uh, show what you can do and let it take care of itself. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, because, and I'm, I'm glad you're walking it through because for a lot of people, particularly in this market, and it's always, I guess it's always been this way. There's always like, what do I do? When do I leave? What's the right time to leave? Am I leaving just for the money? Am I leaving for the opportunity? And I think a lot of people, let's say on the blind you know, uh, platform, but then anywhere, LinkedIn, what have you, it's it's always trying to wrestle with what's the right time. Should I move? Should I not move? Should I just move for the money? So it's 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 interesting your thought process, how, how like you make these decisions. And, and Jack, I was always you know wanting to learn and also work with people. I mean, one of the other uh, reasons for kind of making some changes had to do with uh, you know getting different experiences of working with different people. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I've been fortunate. I've worked for some great people that I learned so much from and, and also 
collaborated with a lot of peers, and had employees that have worked with me. And sometimes that was, that was uh, the draw, like working with um, you know, a different type of person or a different skill and, and being in a different location. Um, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm very strong about is culture. Um, and again, uh, IBM had a great culture. Uh, Cisco had a great culture. Anaplan had a great culture. And when you have that type of experience, you, you learn a lot and you, you, it allows you to thrive, right? Um, and that's what I try to create as a leader, to try to create an organization, a culture that people feel that it's a great place to be part of. It's not just a job. It's an experience where you're able to really make a difference and enjoy what you're doing. Uh, and as a result, people then, you know, they, they excel um, and they do even more than what you ask them to do. Now, how does you've it feel? Kind of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rick. You, you've kind of hinted at this already, kind of in, in terms of just this focus on finding internal mentors or sponsors, people that you want to learn from, or just having that kind of lifelong interest in learning but I, I want to go one step deeper you know like at some of these large companies often the career ladder or kind of steps to making approach of getting a promotion uh is quite long or you know there's a process to go through um you know how does someone rise up through the ranks to become you know from an intern to an experienced professional within the finance organization or your whatever function you are, to eventually becoming that executive that in that vice president, senior vice president, executive vice president role? So, you know, they, there are career paths in, in all organizations, but I found that um, I, I sort of like I, I said before, I, I didn't go through the traditional career paths. I I'd sort of like right. understood what those career paths were. I put them aside mm -hmm. um, and I find um, for me and also for people that have worked for me, it comes down to performance. Um, if you contribute and you provide value, that value is recognized. Someone is gonna give you another opportunity to, to try another challenge and provide that value somewhere else. That, that's what opens doors. Um, you, know, you could say, okay, I did this for X number of, of, of years and therefore I'm ready for that. That's one way, but I think you know, doing what you want to do, but but being recognized for the contribution that you make goes a long way to allowing you to try different other, uh, whether they're lateral or whether they're you know uh, promotional opportunities, um, and and that's that's what I strongly encourage, um, and I try to cultivate that. You know, if I look at Anna Plan, um, we we promoted people based on what they were able to achieve, um, and also then deliver in a new role. And I want to do the same thing at, at Velocity Global. Uh, when I look at the opportunity that's ahead for us uh, here, it, it's, it's a growth opportunity. When you have a growth opportunity, you're going to want people that are going to try different experiences, contribute one way, and then try something else. And that allows them to broaden their experience, but also move up that career ladder um, and, and be available for leadership roles, senior leadership roles, uh, and, and that goes a long way. So, so Frank, for people who may not be aware, you know, maybe you could share a little bit of what Velocity does and why it's better than remote.com and deal <laughs> the others out there in this space. So, so maybe you could elaborate, like, what's, sure. how's the business and how is it to now, from going from a CFO to kind of being the guy running the whole show as well? So uh, yeah, I'll start with uh, Velocity Global. Uh, so what we do is uh, we allow our customers uh, to um, really expand their business uh, through their employee network on a global scale. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that companies face, um, whether they're in the United States moving from one state to another or in a certain country and trying to be global. Today's world I would say is borderless. Um, and when we think about um, the global economy, uh, businesses really are looking that broad as far as what they need to do. When it comes to hiring people, it could take anywhere from 18 to 24 months to get established in a new country. Um, for companies that are growing and expanding, that's a long time. 
and it, it basically defers your ability to be productive in, in those countries. When you work with Velocity Global, since we have legal entities uh, in 185 countries, we are able to get our customers to start in a country within weeks. Uh, they leverage our legal entity. We onboard employees uh, on their behalf. Those employees do the work for that company as if they were employees of that company. But we allow, uh, we provide uh, both a technology platform that allows our customers and also the employees of our customers uh, to have that interface so that we can onboard them, uh, we can pay them, we can manage them uh, throughout their journey uh, with us and also with our customers, uh, provide them with benefits and different types of perks, um, which, which we offload from a lot of our customers so they can spend their time focused on the engineering work that these employees need to do or the financial work that these employees need to do and so forth. So that's, that's what we, uh, we provide. It's called employer of record space. It's been around for a number of years. Uh, the difference I would say of late is the technology platform that makes it much more efficient and effective for customers to do exactly what I just said and really kind of expand their business uh, on a more global scale. And the key thing for our customers right now is getting talent. I think all businesses throughout COVID with so many people leaving the workforce through the great resignation, that getting talent um, anywhere in the world is important. And also looking at the cost of that talent, we allow them that ability to do that. If they need engineering skill, if they need any type of skill, we work with them to do that. So the technology is a differentiator. The other thing which I say, uh, and why I think Velocity Global um, is a leader, uh, we've been in business for nine years. Uh, we, were one of the, we were the pioneer in this space. And as, as a result of being the pioneer, we've built the infrastructure. As I said before, it's the legal entity that allows our customers to be able to ramp up pretty quickly in the different countries they want to operate in. Having that ability, both from a legal perspective, from an HR perspective, from all the governance is critical. It's the compliance that's necessary to make it um, risk-free for our customers to leverage the employment in all these different um, countries. That's what we provide. We've been at it the longest. We have the broadest with 185 countries that we offer. And then we have a technology platform that leverages that. So I, I feel that we have the best uh, that we can offer customers and prospects in this space than anyone else. Do you see any trends in terms of where the people are? Are you seeing in your business that's um, in you know Eastern Europe or Asia or Latin America? Any any trends that if let's say people watching say, you know what, I'm up for a venture. You know, maybe you know I want to see I can find an opportunity in a different country, different state. Like where? What are you seeing? So it depends a lot on what type of skills you're looking for and where you're trying to operate. So mm -hmm. I'll. I'll, first, I'll start with retail. Uh, we do a lot of work with retail companies. Um, we have over 50 large um, you know, global retail companies. When, when retail companies expand, it could be through wanting to have different sales personnel, whether they're opening new stores or different offices as their markets are expanding. Uh, that's one that I would say is of interest. And, and by the way, that's going to happen in markets that are growing. Um, so there's a lot of activity um, outside the inside the United States in different states uh, with its growth, but also outside in Europe and also in Asia uh, from, from that perspective. When you think about uh, companies and technology, they're looking for um, engineering skills, you know, highly trained engineers. Traditionally, there's been a lot of engineering skills on the West Coast and also in the Northeast and, and in parts of like Austin and Texas. As the needs have been expanding both on the hardware side and the software side, and also the focus on more efficient, cost efficient um, uh, skill, there's been uh, interest um, in Eastern Europe, of course, um, because there's been a tremendous amount of growth in that talent in Eastern Europe. There's also growth in India. Uh, there's also growth in South America. Uh, we just, from a Velocity Global perspective, 
just uh, set up a team of engineers in Brazil. So that skill, which was pretty much located in certain regions in the United States is now much more global. And so uh, there's customers that come to us and they wanna expand in some of these regions and we help them uh, to get set up in some of the, whether it's Eastern Europe, South America, uh, or in India and, and those areas that we work through. So th that's some examples of, of, of some of it. We see a lot of sales and retail, and we see a lot of uh, activity around engineers and expanding from that perspective. Got it. I, I, I want to take a look at, at kind of your leadership background. You know, you've been an executive vice president, CFO, chairman, CEO, board member. I mean, can you paint a picture of what it's like to become a C-suite executive? How you went from you know senior vice president to kind of entering the C-suite? Like, what was that first few months of the job look like? So, the, so when I when I think about C-suite, C-suite would be like a you know a CEO or direct report to a CEO. That's my definition based on right. what you would say. And so the first opportunity I had, although I had some senior uh, level positions um, in IBM. My first venture, and this is one of the reasons I made the change at the time, was when I became the CFO of SanDisk. Um, and that was to, one, get that CFO experience, but also kind of work with our founder CEO, Eli Hirari at the time, um, really uh, to uh, learn uh, from him. Um, so for me, um, of course, you always have those uh, butterflies in the stomach, a new venture, a new company, but also a new role and a very senior role and a very public role. It was a public company. And so investors dealing with the external as well as the internal. So all of that was new. Um, and so again, it was a matter of uh, first going in with a sense of confidence, uh, building on a lot of the experience I had from IBM, but also learning. Um, I leveraged, um, you know, uh, our CEO founder, Eli Harari, who I had a lot of respect for. Um, he was, uh, early, in the early days, he was very helpful in, in, in working uh, through and giving me some of the experiences, but also the coaching that was necessary. I also had a good board um, at the time, individuals uh, that had been in tech, individuals that have been finance leaders, actually the head of our audit committee at the time, Kathy Lego. She had been um, more extensively in, in finance roles. And she, so she was a good coach, uh, helping me learn about what it was like dealing with investors and, 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 and that whole thing, having earnings calls um, and callbacks and things like that. So, so it, was, it was new, um, but I learned a lot. Uh, we did well. One of the key things that I did there uh, initially was uh, getting involved in uh, a major partnership that we did with Toshiba because we wanted to really expand our presence in the in the fab space and silicon. And so negotiating that um, on behalf of the company uh, with a Japanese partner, I learned a lot about culture uh, from that perspective because I spent quite a bit of time in Tokyo back and forth, um, a great example from that perspective. Um, so th that was that was one that um, I kind of kind of stepped into. It was something I wanted to do. Uh, I learned. I had a lot of people that were helping me along the way, and I, I thought I did quite well. I mean, was there a particular like job, like level or, or promotion that was the most difficult for you to earn? Kind of looking back, um, you know, how, how do you think you earned it or achieved it? So, you know, the, so it really goes back to early in my career. When I started with IBM, um, of course, there were individual contributor roles um, in finance. And, you know, IBM, you know, the value that I saw in IBM at the time was a company that had a tremendous amount of legacy for management capability and skill and leadership. Um, they had in-house training and development like I don't think ever existed, um, you know, similar. I think GE was probably the next closest that wow. offered that type of, uh, of training and development. And so I remember in the roles, the individual contributor roles uh, that I, uh, I had, I did have, I aspired to be a leader. 
um, and a manager. And at the time, you, in order to be a first time manager in IBM, you had to have a certain amount of experience but you also had to have a certain amount of training. They had these training um, offerings, like you'd go for a week or two week kind of um, skills and you'd have to be ready. They would say whether you were ready uh, to be a leader. And I remember that first management job that I had, I did have like team leader roles right prior and that gave me some good skill, but that first management role and what IBM used to do, they gave you a certificate. And I still have that certificate today as to you know, first time manager and so forth. And then of course you got other certificates along the way, like second uh, level management and so forth. Wow. But you know, that, that whole experience of, of learning and developing to, to kind of be that manager. And of course, when you step into the role, you're never ready. I mean, you're ready for it, but you know, dealing with people and some of the challenges that can come up, not only the business challenges, the personal challenges, Again, another experience that you learn. And of course, when you get into it, you always have to consult with someone else, another mentor and so forth, which IBM was great at. So that was a role that I was very, one, I wanted to do it, but I was very apprehensive. And it was a big step, um, but it was the right one because it allowed me to kind of be the leader. It developed a lot of leadership skills that I have today to take on a CEO role at Anaplan and then now another CEO role at uh, Velocity Global. You know, I appreciate when you mentioned about a little nervous for taking on a job because oftentimes you know, people have the preconceived notion of the C-suite executive, like they're going to come in and they have everything under control and super confident. But I love your vulnerability and being open. Say, yeah, yeah, it's a little scary. I mean, you didn't use that word, but you know, a little daunting, which makes you very human. And a lot of times people look from the outside, right, Rick? You like you look from the outside, you're like, oh, they're going to come oh, in. They have and to have, have all the swagger. answers, right? Right. They've done this before, or, or they, you know, can easily call up someone that's like, you know, has done it before yeah. and, and get all the answers right away and just like, come in and be decisive, right? Yeah, yeah. and I like how you talk, because like, you bring it down to, you know, a level where then people who are watching listeners will go, oh, all right, it's okay to be a little nervous when I take that new role, and I kind of, you know, level up. That's part of it, you know, because it's one of those things like, each individual, like, oh my gosh, why is it, I have butterflies in my stomach? I'm nervous. What's wrong with me? I should be confident. And I guess we all go through this. We're all human, but we don't talk about it. And so it's I appreciate surprising. you everybody, kind of- everybody, everybody goes through it. And yeah, it's yeah. true. And, and, you know, the key thing, which again, it's, it's, it's really leveraging when you're in those situations, leveraging the people around you, people that you trust, people that you respect, you know, asking someone for help, asking someone for advice. It goes a long way. People are more than willing to do that. But not many people, you know, they feel, you know, that that's vulnerability that I have to ask that question, right? They're going to say, oh, I don't know something. Yeah. But I found that asking and, and looking for advice, counsel goes a long way. And it doesn't show any vulnerability. It shows that you want to learn. You yeah. Want to be yeah, because I think a lot of people look at the other way. Like if I ask, that shows I don't know. And then I'm like somehow weaker because I don't know this as opposed to saying, hey, I don't understand this. Can you help me? Can you point me in the right direction? Can you get some mentor for me? Can you get, maybe I need some upskilling, some training. And, and I think that's helpful for people to hear from a guy like yourself, who's been in these senior roles to say, even after you know, 20, 30 years of doing it, you still have to learn and you still have to go to people for advice and guidance and counsel and seek you know, ideas from different places. Anytime you have a promotion, you're really stepping yeah. into that next level. Yeah new, you know, responsibilities. So you do have to, you leverage a lot of your background and experience, but there's new things that you want to take on. But so it happens. It also sounds like what you have to do and we're reading between the lines is build over the years, a network of people who you can turn to for advice. Like, you know, in addition to learning the skills and the jobs you have to build, you know, like having mentors, you know, people in your network who you could go to you know, have mentees so that when times get difficult or challenging, you're not isolated. You have people you can could, could rely upon, right? So I think we don't that's talk true. about that too much, but it seems that's from what you're saying in your in your story, that's really mission critical. It, it is. And Jack, it works at all different levels. I'll, I'll give you another example. You know, the years I spent at Anaplan, um, you know, again, we were a private, privately held VC company. 
we went into the public markets. We then had to develop a public company board. And, and as a CEO, you know, I've learned this over the years, you know, the CEO can be one of the loneliest jobs out there because, right, you're at that yeah. top. But even there, um, what, what I found is having a great board of individuals with different experiences, different perspectives goes a long way because you have them also for coaching and for, you know, sounding, you know, sounding board and so forth. And I leveraged that throughout my experience at even as a CEO to be able to kind of go to the board, members of the board and ask, what about this? Can I run this one by you? And because they had so much different and varied experience and came at it a different way, it was very helpful. You know, this, this might be a stupid question, but you, you know, you had this career path going all the way up to the CEO title. Does it have to be this way nowadays or is it like? You know, do we still have that mindset? Okay, I'm an individual contributor. I'm going to manage one person, manage five people, manage 10 people. Then I'm going to be, you know, a senior vice president. Or now, are there other ways that you could be successful and happy in your life without, you know, how, you know, you're not going to be a failure if you're not a CFO or a CEO or something like that? I, 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 I think, yes, I think that's, that's exactly. I mean, you, you have to be, um, you, you can be very, good at what you do at various levels in an organization and contribute greatly um, and, and be very happy. Um, it, it, it's, if I look back again, as I said before, I never had a, a desire. I want to get there. It just, things just happened. But right. my, my objective was to enjoy what I was doing. And I, I, have to, I can look back at every role that I've had. And I've, I've had this conversation before, not just now, I've enjoyed um, all the roles that I've had because I learned, as I said before, but I also worked with some really great people. Um, and I think that's where fulfillment comes from. Um, and there's so many people. Um, and I think that's what makes a great organization. I think that's what makes a great culture. If you have a majority of people feeling that level of fulfillment and that ability to kind of really contribute, um, it, it goes a long way. And you don't necessarily want everybody to kind of going after that top yeah. job because that's not success for a company. It's not success for an organization. But how do you, you know, how do you get those good people? It sounds like, I don't know if you were fortunate to surround yourself with good people or you made your own luck to like, there, a lot of times, let's be honest, Rick, you probably see this on blind. A lot of times you don't get good people around you. You get good people who are toxic around you. So like, how, so, so, right? So that, I mean, like, how did you get- so now, now, now you want to go into so, <laughs> a culture. I mean, they're, they're all different types of people. Yeah. But gravitate, my, my advice has always been gravitate to those that could really be helpful. I, I hear what you're saying, Jack, not everybody's yeah. that way, but you can find all organizations have, have people uh, with with different experiences, different knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, different backgrounds, and I and I think you learn from that. That's the whole thing about you know the whole thing diversity and diversity in so many different ways in, in experiences that goes a long way. So I think you can always find out. I, I always I mean, did I work with challenging individuals? Yes. Um, I find when you spend your time with those that are let's say um, in more of a, a positive uh, mode, where they're contributing where they feel good about what, what the organization can deliver upon, gravitate to those. That helps lift the rest of the team up um, and they become more higher performing. Um, you, you can develop organizations to be higher performing uh, teams. Um, we see that in sports a lot. We see that, I think, in business as well. Um, allowing a culture that encourages that type of engagement. I, I'll go back and even look at my, and I did write a book on this upstanding, uh, primarily during COVID, reflecting back on the different cultures and experiences mm. I've had. But I'll, I'll just talk about Anaplan. When I joined Anaplan, I would say we had a bit of a challenge culture. We had- we Oh, had, can you interrupt me for a second? Because I, I got to admit, I, I'm going to follow your advice. I'm not really sure what Anaplan is. Can you maybe share? That? Okay, like, sure. Just... So Anaplan is a planning software company. Okay. So it, it's a cloud-based uh, application that allows businesses um, in different parts of the organization to do their planning. 
the simple way of saying do their budgeting, kind of go into a, a model, like it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a spreadsheet in, in a uh, SaaS application that allows them to enter information, do different analytics, provide a, a baseline for managing a lot of spend and growth. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what Anaplan was all about. And so we sold a lot to um, large companies, medium-sized companies uh, from, from that perspective. So when we joined, when I joined back on the cultural piece, you know, there was uh, something called uh, everybody, it was, the company is called Anaplan, but um, women referred to the organization as Manaplan, um, which, you know, after being there for a couple of months, and I heard that a few times, I started to step back and realize that women didn't feel like they had a voice at the table. Um, and it was a very, so it's, that's just one example of not allowing people um, to, to really feel safe or feel that they can contribute. And, and through different techniques, it was to allow uh, much more openness, much more safeness uh, for women or for others to be able to feel that they had an environment where they can really excel and where they can contribute. And as a result of that, it allowed um, more of a high performing organization over the years where we were able to accelerate our growth and, and, and deliver a great experience to our customers. Well, I, I, I know you just started at Velocity Global, but it seems like along the way, you've learned a lot in terms of being a leader about how to deal with the personal aspect, the workplace culture. You know, what are the ideas that you have for kind of creating that high performing, you know, positive enriching culture at Velocity Global now that you're the CEO? So, so there, there are various techniques um, that I've used over the years and I, um, ex, you know, right now it's, it's early days, but working uh, through this with Velocity Global, again, it's, we, we have a great culture at Velocity Global, but allowing us to be even as we're growing faster over the next several years, being more of a high-performing culture um, and people really kind of working well together and enjoying the experience goes a long way. It starts with, first of all, operating with a larger purpose, um, where everybody in the organization gets to know what success looks like for the company. And it's I, I've used this before. It's called a vision, strategy, execution, and metrics. It's, it's really resonating with the vision of what company's trying to achieve. What is that strategy? Um, over the next couple of years? And then what are some of the initiatives that are going to get us to fulfill that strategy and the metrics that are going to be used to determine success or failure? So operating with that larger purpose where people can really uh, connect what they do to what the company uh, sees as its mission and vision and success uh, metrics going forward is, is, is first. Second is values, um, being values-led knowing what those four or five or six values that not only just the CEO, but the company itself acknowledges as uh, criti uh, critical things for, for success for the people. And that could be things like being authentic um, or being collaborative. Um, that knowing what that is at, you know, in my prior role, what we did from that perspective, rather than me decide what the values are, we did a bottoms up, determination where volunteers kind of came together and we had conversations. What's important for us? Why, why are you here? What makes, what motivates you? We had 67% of the organization, the company volunteering remotely to participate in a lot of these conversations for when we then decided what those six values that we then started to not only put on the wall and on our website, but start to emulate. And, and, and make sure that we were following through on what those values. That's the second. The, the next thing is, is follow through on your convictions. So what, what, what do you see as, 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 as what makes that company? Because um, you can get, you, 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 if you have certain convictions as far as what you're trying to enable the workforce to do, um, that comes through. And then finally, um, it all comes about when there's challenging times and whether challenging times, economic times or adversity that may come up or a situation and how you deal with that 
really kind of shows what you're made up of. And that's why I think organizations just like people have characters. So the culture, if you really do all this the right way, you then start to have the company has a character and people know what that character is and they choose to be part of that character, just like they choose to, as an individual, you choose to be part of you know, individuals that you kind of associate with, whether you work with or on the personal side. And so I think if you, if you work through that and you have a plan um, and, you, and you stay the course um, and you deal with um, any resistors, you know, you, you have the ability to kind of just not, not to criticize, but coach some of them along the way as far as what we stand for. Uh, it, it, it really kind of um, allows for that um, culture that allows people to feel that they want to be that higher performer. Got it. No, I, that makes a lot of sense because I, I think on blind, the common perception is, oh, I, I need to keep my head down. The best way to get promoted is just to show that I'm like a functional as, expert in my discipline. You know, maybe I don't need to really focus on kind of like the interpersonal skills or, you know, working cross-functionally or even just working with like different stakeholders, but it's like, I'm, I'm going to be the best darn software engineer and just ship out the best code day in and day out for, for each sprint, right? And each week. And eventually over time, you know, I'll, I'll start to mentor an intern or, or maybe, you know, like become a, a manager. And eventually that, that's how I'm going to get my way up to being, you know, uh, an executive in the, the technical side, but it, it's, it's really more comprehensive, right? Like it's taking that step back and saying, actually, what can I learn about the business or what can I learn about even myself and, and others and kind of apply those to, you know, that, that certainly that functional competency in terms of what your role is, uh, but also in terms of kind of what drives that impact for the business or the industry. Even. Yeah. Excellent point. And, and you know, one that I've just recently in Velocity Global um, that I'm going through right now. So I, I hear what you're saying. People can say, hey, I'm going to just do my job. Here, here's where it doesn't work. When you think about a customer first or a customer centric organization, you got to put yourself in the, in the seat of a customer. That customer works with a Velocity Global at different points along the way. If that customer starts to see a fragmentation of that experience because someone is doing this job but not handing it off the right way to the next person. That's where it breaks down. And so what I've been doing, even over the last couple of weeks at Velocity Global is one, it's allowing me to learn about the company more, but I'm going through as, as a mock customer, the customer journey. And I've just wow. actually had my last session uh, just this week where I've been working with different touch points and I've been observing. And now I'm gonna kind of share back my feedback but it's when those handoffs are not seamless and perfect because everyone is not collaborating to the full extent or jumping in when there's a challenge to say, it's not her job or his job, it's my job because I'm part, you know, I, 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 I like this whole thing about the founder's mindset, which is if you view whatever you do in a company, no matter if it's a small company or a large global company, if you take an approach that you are just like the owner or the founder. And therefore, whatever challenge you see, you're gonna go after and, and contribute to solving that or getting others to help solve it. You, you then um, do a lot more. And that goes back to what I was saying about culture. When you get people that are not here just to do their job, but they're here to kind of be part of that winning team to, to, to be able to make your customer, whoever that is, the most successful they can be in providing that value, that's that's all part of what makes this uh, work. No, I, I, I love that formula for winning and, and, and really leveling up. Um, I, I appreciate that, that insight and that advice. Thanks for coming on the show, Frank. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you, you so work. much. I appreciate it.